This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 152 with guest Alexandra Jameson. This show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company that believes therapy should be affordable, confidential, and convenient. You know I'm always telling you how important therapy is, and a Talkspace therapist can help put you on the path to a happier life. For a special offer for our listeners, visit Talkspace.com forward slash YKAL and use code YKAL to get $30 off your first month. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey, Ass Kickers, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad you are here and so happy to bring you my guest today. Alexander Jameson is here and we had such a great conversation about cravings and so much more. But before we jump in, I have a very exciting announcement. People have been asking me for months and months about this, and I am so happy to let you know that the third annual Tanning Tacos and Transformation event is open for registration. Conference style this year instead of a retreat, and that means more women will be coming. We've opened up more seats to be able to accommodate a bigger group. We're covering topics on fear, confidence, and communication, and how to take all these new things that you learn on the conference home with you. There's also opportunities to have dinner with us in a small, intimate group, but those tickets are limited. It's on the beach, like literally on the beach in Orange County, California, in October. Get your tickets now while there are still bonuses and the price is at its early bird rate. You can go to triple T conference.com. That's the word triple, the letter T and conference.com. If you have a hard time spelling conference like I do, you can just go to the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a clickable link there. Just go to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 152. All the links will be there. I am so excited to hopefully see you there at the Triple T conference. <laughs> All right. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about Alexandra. Alexandra Jameson is the best selling author of Women, Food, and Desire, co creator and co star of the Oscar nominated documentary Super Size Me, and highly sought after wellness expert for thousands. Alexandra Jameson has made it her mission to empower women to create epic lives by honoring their cravings and kicking body shame to the curb. So without further ado, here is Alex. Hi, Alex. Thanks so much for being here. Hello. So happy to be here with your ass kickers. <laughs> Yay. Someone who knows who knows their pet name. Oh, I love my ass kickers. So thank you again for being here. You and I have sort of been in the online world and have been kind of canceling. I had to cancel on you because I had a, a awful thing happen to me in the fall. And so this has been kind of a long awaited conversation. And I'm so glad to be able to share it with my people. And I want to start out really with your story, because as they heard about in your in your bio, but you used to be a devout vegan and then something changed. So I'm going to let you tell the story. But can you, along with telling us what happened, like what did you have to face in the aftermath of this change and kind of what helped you to rise up? Absolutely. So I want to preface this by saying some of my best friends are vegan. <laughs> so, we got nothing against the, vegans. Right? We love them. <laughs> this is about one woman's personal journey to herself. So I co-created and co-starred in the documentary Super Size Me with my now ex-husband. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the movie, he ate nothing but McDonald's for a month yep. and he got really sick. And I was the vegan chef girlfriend. And this was our real life, by the way. I was a vegan chef who was rolling her eyes in the background and making comments about how disgusting this was. Well, I, you know, we didn't know that that little movie was going to have this global impact. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly had a book deal and started coaching people all over the world and became professionally vegan for about a decade. Professionally vegan. Wow. That yes. sounds like a lot of pressure. 
Well, at first it wasn't, you know, Mm -hmm. at first, because I was about two years into my vegan lifestyle when we made Supersize Me and it had totally changed my health. It was absolutely the right thing to do. It helped me get out of a serious candida overgrowth. I mean, migraine headaches every day, depressed, Mm -hmm. 30 pounds overweight. It was absolutely perfect. And then go forward 10 years. Okay. I've written a book all about vegan diet and Supersize Me. Morgan and I are now married. I have a baby. Mm -hmm. And then our life started to fall apart. Our marriage was falling apart. He left for someone else. Mm -hmm. I was depressed again. I was a single mom. I didn't have a career anymore because I'd taken a couple years off to raise our kid. And I started to fall apart. I was exhausted. I was I was actually really, really skinny, which now I see was the beginning of hyperthyroidism. I couldn't gain weight, but I was exhausted, depressed, depleted, and I started craving meat. And this was bad. This was not mm-hmm. good. Right? My Reminds me, wasn't there a Friends episode where that happened when Phoebe got pregnant? And it was like... <laughs> I didn't want friends and that Joey, much, but... yeah, and Joey was like eating more meat for her, like twice as much meat. Yeah, it was it was funny. So, Sympathy sorry, meat eating, I love <laughs> yeah. it. So, and there's another level to all this. It wasn't just the stress and you know being vegan for ten years. It was also that. You know, when your life starts to fall apart, it creates a lot of added pressures on your body. And I thought that our marriage collapsed because I wasn't attractive anymore. Mm -hmm. I totally internalized the reasons why our marriage fell apart. So I thought my body was bad. Something was wrong with me. And now I was craving meat. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So I struggled for a couple of years in silence. And, you know, I still had a little bit of a, an online presence. And I was just, you know, putting out recipes and coaching a few people on the side. And then I realized, like, I need to listen to my body. I was trying everything in the vegan framework. I was eating all the seaweed. I was Mm -hmm. eating all the hemp protein, like all the things you're supposed to do. Nothing was working. And I started telling a couple of really close friends who I thought, okay, they're not going to judge me if I tell them about this. And luckily, my dear friend, Amy, she was like, girl, eat a burger. Like, I don't care. I love you so much. Whatever. (laughs) So it was a couple of friends who supported me. And when I finally ate some meat in my own home, like behind closed doors, nobody else there, my body felt physically so good. That's so interesting. Oh, like the body responds so quickly mm-hmm. when you really listen to her. Take care of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but emotionally I was in total turmoil. So I was eating some meat and fish, like again, secretly behind closed doors. I mean, I was now developing disordered eating, right? I was hiding how I was eating. Oh, no. I wasn't doing it right. Uh-huh. And then in public, like trying to figure out what I was, who I am. And, but as I started eating more meat, my hormones turned back on, my iron levels went up. I was chronically anemic. That was another aspect Mm. of my health issues. And I started feeling like, oh, sex. I remember sex. Mm -hmm. Sex was good. Well, wait, I have a body. Oh, maybe I'm not repulsive. Maybe I should date. And all of these things kind of wove together, eating meat again, listening to my body. Oh, like I need physical pleasure. Like I need to be in my body again Mm -hmm. and start dating. You know, I was going through a really long drawn out divorce, not having any fun, basically just being a parent and working a little bit. So As I started dating a little bit, eating more meat, I met a really wonderful dude who I just married last year. And he, Bob, said, you should really own this. Like, you have a new life now. You need to be who you are. You need to come clean. You need Mm -hmm. to come out as no longer vegan. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to do this. So I wrote a blog post. I'm not vegan anymore. And I edited that thing for like four months. I'll I could, bet. <laughs> not. How can I tell the truth, but not tell the truth? Like, <laughs> yeah. It was so perfectly crafted and I never published it. Mm-hmm. So then I don't know if you know Jonathan Fields, but he's yeah. a friend of ours. And he was like, oh, you know, Alex, I'd love to have you on the show. We were just getting to know each other. He had me on his podcast and he said, can I talk about this thing, how you're eating meat now? Cause like I had been out to dinner with them and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of eating meat now. And so we did an interview interview on his show. And he's like, this isn't going to come out for three months. So, you know, you have time to tell the world that you're not vegan anymore. 
And then he called me the week after our interview and said, you know what? It's ready to go now. So you might want to tell people. I was like, oh, my gosh. No. Mm. (laughs) So luckily, Jonathan kind of pushed me out of the nest. I published the article and it was I mean, it went viral in the way that we all hope that our work is going to go viral. But this was not the thing that I wanted to go viral. Mm. I lost half my newsletter list, everyone unsubscribed, thousands and thousands of comments on this blog post, vicious comments. I got death threat emails from people for saying, you are a traitor, you're a murderer, you're worse than a regular meat eater because you've been vegan. You know, we hope you die. Oh my God. It was so scary. And I started to realize like, oh my gosh, like, This is why women have such a hard time figuring out food Mm -hmm. because we're so afraid of people's judgment. Yeah. I mean, I experienced it on this huge level, right? I lost actual friends. I had Mm -hmm. friends who were vegan who no longer speak to me. They did whole podcasts about what a terrible person I am. And that's what women fear. We fear that judgment and backlash with food. You know, luckily, there were a few people like Jonathan and other people who saw it online, and they kind of rose to my defense and said, wait a minute, like, what are we doing here? Why are we vilifying someone for changing her diet in the face of health issues, basically? So it led to a bigger conversation and it led me to really look at like, okay, so, you know, I learned on a deeper level how to listen to my body in this process. And that's something that I've been teaching my clients how to do for years, but I've never framed it in the way of what your body is asking for might actually be what you need. Let's look at that in a deeper way. So hmm. that's what I've been doing now for the last four years. Wow. So, so tell us like, how did you, cause that does not sound like an easy time. I mean, like losing friends, losing your audience, which is, you know, part of your livelihood at that point. So how did you, was there anything specific that you did that got you through that just emotionally? Really good friends. I mean, you learn who your friends are in a crisis like this. True. And I've always had a big, wide, diverse group of friends, but I saw how some people were like rallying to my defense or calling me or saying, hey, you know, everything's going to be okay. People I didn't even know that well at the time Mm -hmm. have since become really close. Mm -hmm. And then other people, you're like, wow, maybe if they care that much about what I eat, maybe they're not my friends. Maybe they never really were. Maybe the only thing we had in common was was a different type of friendship. Yeah. (laughs) That evolves and changes. That's a really nice way of saying that. (laughs) (laughs) Not my friend anymore. So I was luckily raised by two really strong individuals. My dad was a high school principal for 25 years and a high school teacher for years before that. My mom was a hippie feminist artist. They raised us in their own ways to be independent thinkers to be good citizens of the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that way of living in the world, like my mom encouraged me to like travel by yourself, go to Europe when you're in college, like do all these things. And that kind of thing led me like, I have always felt like I can make friends anywhere. And if people aren't the right fit for me, or if like, I'm, I'm fine with disagreeing with people like you and I have talked about this. I like having a a heated debate with a good friend who I, I have their heart and I know they have mine. But if someone is really like turning their back on me because of who I am, Mm -hmm. like, you know what? I can make new friends. Mm -hmm. And I've felt that way about my relationship too, honestly, like when, when I discover that I was, you know, my husband was cheating on me and he was in love with someone else. Like it took a couple of months. I did try. We did go to therapy, but I was like, I'm not staying in a relationship with someone, even though he's famous, even though, you know, he's got all these people in his Rolodex, like I'm not staying in a relationship that I don't feel safe in. Yeah. I will find one else. And yes. that was really helpful. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And okay. So you know, speaking, so you went through this time period where you really just listened to your body. And I know that that is a lot of the work that you do with women. And it sounds like you, you know, you were having this craving of eating meat and you listen to your body, but what if the cravings, you know, cause like sometimes I am like hankering for a donut and I'll eat a donut. <laughs> and then it's like, I want a donut every day. Right. So, so right. where, so talk about that for a minute, like kind of yeah. break that apart. Well, your cravings are information from your body. Uh Your body is always looking for balance. 
that is her main mode of operation. She's looking for balance in some way. So your cravings are a language. We just have to learn how to speak that language. So my cravings for meat were telling me you're depleted and you're iron deficient. Mm -hmm. My cravings for sugar are a message that my bacteria is out of balance. Like I still have to be aware of the bacterial balance in my body. Your sugar cravings might be telling you you're overworked, that you need more rest, that your bacteria is out of balance. You know, maybe you've been eating more refined foods and you've been letting the natural sweeteners peak in a little bit. So you actually have more candida and other yeasts, etc. And those bacteria They live in you. We have a symbiotic relationship with them. It's one of the four root causes of craving is this bacterial imbalance. And they actually communicate with your brain and your nervous system. So I always jokingly call them the beast within or the Uh puppet master. Like you will want a donut. And even if you've like made this dedicated, concerted effort, I'm going off sugar for a month. And there's this part of you that's like, oh, I need it. You're like, oh, my God, I feel like what is this force within me taking me to the ice cream in the freezer? Uh It is those bacteria because they will die without sugar, but they need to die. You need to bring everything back into balance. So you can have a bacterial craving like that. You can have a nutritional craving. You know, part of my meat craving was nutrition. I was totally iron deficient. A lot of other things were going on as well. But you can be craving a food because your body knows it will give you what you need. So that takes a little bit of nuance. It takes some examination, you know, maybe getting a blood test and finding out how your nutrient levels, your mineral levels, etc. Like we women have chocolate cravings far and above most other cravings. Most of us are walking around totally magnesium deficient. And chocolate is actually a really good magnesium source. Hmm. It's very calming. It's very soothing. Plus, we get the sugar and we get the little hit of theobromine, which is like caffeine. But then there's those other cravings that we have, the emotional cravings and the physical cravings. And that's not something that diets or nutrition books ever talk about. Hey, Ask Kickers, we're going to get back to this interview in just a minute. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. People ask me all the time, what are the tools I should use for my small business? There's so many things to manage. Welcome to life being self-employed. Is it challenging? Yes, but our friends at FreshBooks believe the rewards are so worth it. The working world has changed. With the growth of the internet, there's never been more opportunities for the self-employed entrepreneur. To meet this need, FreshBooks is excited to announce the launch of an all-new version of their cloud accounting software. The all-new FreshBooks is not only ridiculously easy easy to use. It's also packed full of powerful features. Create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. Set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid up to four days faster. And see when your client has seen your invoice and put an end to the guessing games. FreshBooks is offering a 30 day unrestricted free trial to my listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash kick ass and enter your kick ass life in the how did you hear about us? section. So I've talked to a lot of people about cravings all across the board, and I've never heard it explained that way. So thank you. The whole aspect of yeast and and bacteria, and that makes a lot of sense. So I know that that there's a, a percentage of my audience that listens to this podcast that has struggled with alcohol. And whether they identify as an alcoholic or not, In my experience, I got sober five years ago and I consume sugar now, unlike I did before. So it makes total sense that when I took the alcohol out of my life, you know, my sugar cravings went up. And for a while, I just honored that because I was like one thing at a time. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then very smart. And then what's what's interesting is that I haven't talked a whole lot about this. Um, Melissa Ramos was on a few weeks ago and I, I did mention it. I did a whole 30 about a year and a half ago. And I didn't I don't talk a lot about my diet here it's just because I just don't. But I don't like to advocate because I'm not an expert in it. So I don't like to advocate different kind of like things like that. And, and the reason that my husband and I both did it. He wanted to do it. And for those of you that don't know what it is, it's basically like you you cut a lot of things, grains and sugars and even legumes and anything processed out of your diet for 30 days. It's very 
I mean, the only word I can think of is it's very strict. And I also have struggled with an eating disorder. I did not realize that Melissa Hartwig, founder of the Whole30, says probably shouldn't do the Whole30 if you have struggled with an eating disorder. I found that out when I was two weeks in and was like, I right. oh, no wonder I feel like I'm losing my fucking mind. Yeah. So, and let's be honest, most American women have had some kind of disordered eating. Yes. And it just, it kind of like triggered all that back. So I don't, again, you guys don't all run out and do it and say that Andrea did it. I'm not endorsing it. <laughs> do your own research, talk to your doctor, et cetera. But what I found interesting is that I, on the round day 15, I dipped into this depression, like this dark depression that I could not shake. And it wasn't situational. Like there was nothing going on in my life that would constitute it. And I was crying all the time. And my one of my girlfriends was like, I think you should not do the whole 30 anymore. And then I started my mind. It's so weird how the brain works. I started obsessing on gaining weight. And that was like, it was like old eating disorder thoughts that had not come into my brain for years and years and years were suddenly back. So it just is fascinating to me how much food can make a significant impact on our brains. I mean, this is not news. Like, <laughs> oh, food is, food is everything. It is everything. It's everything. I mean, I list this out when I give talks. I say, you know, why do we eat? Why do women eat? And, you know, a couple people will say, oh, hungry or, you know, sad or whatever. And, I, and then I show a list of a hundred different reasons why women mm -hmm. eat. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a short list. I mean, really, we eat for every thing that mm -hmm. happens to us. And my concern with programs like the Whole30, et cetera, basically the whole diet and nutrition culture in America, which is so bass backwards, they only focus on the food or they only focus on emotion, right? There's emotional eating programs and then there's food and nutrition programs like the Whole30. Mm -hmm. You cannot separate those two things. Right. They must come together mm -hmm. because we are emotional eaters. We are all emotional eaters. Even the big guy at the gym who drinks muscle milk, which is arguably a food, he's drinking <laughs> muscle milk after working out based on an emotional decision. Yeah. He wants to be bigger so that he can be seen as more masculine, blah, blah, blah. So we're all doing That's it. Emotional. So mm -hmm. don't beat yourself up for having emotions. Yeah. And I truly believe any food program, detox, cleanse, etc., that does not address both nutrition, what you're eating, and emotion, how you're eating and why you're eating, mm -hmm. is leaving out huge keys to how we are as humans. Yeah. And I think it's, what's also really fascinating is that everyone is different. And, and the reason I, I don't think I mentioned it, the reason that I wanted to do it in the first place was because I was having energy issues and I, I felt like I was eating pretty decent and I was working out. So I'm like, what's going on? Is it because of my age or hormones or what? So I was just mostly curious. And my husband has some arthritis issues in his hands. And so, and he thought maybe cutting all that out would help P.S. It didn't. So we, we did it. And then when I went and saw, I finally went and saw a naturopath because of this sugar craving thing that I was having. And I told her my experience with the Whole30 and she was like, don't ever do that again. And she said that she's like, I haven't done enough research on it, but I will now. But my hunch is that there is a link between people who struggle with alcoholism specifically and the, the way that they metabolize sugar is different than the rest of the world. And therefore your cravings might look different and your healing from them might look a little bit different. So she put mm -hmm. me on a different kind of supplements that I won't get into, but it actually was helpful. So what I encourage is everyone to see your doctor and see a naturopath because she was actually more helpful than my general practitioner. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they really look at the person as a whole being. Yeah. They will ask you, you know, how are your stress levels? How are you sleeping? How's your relationship? Yes. Those things mm -hmm. are so important. And it's, you know, I feel like women's emotions are poo-pooed, belittled, etc., by the medical profession. For the most part, there are some really wonderful doctors out there. By the way, I've been seeing a naturopath since I was like five because of my <laughs> hippie mom going to chiropractors since I was 13. So, you know, it really is important to find an ally, whether yeah. that's a coach or a great doctor or even just a really knowledgeable friend who's willing to support you as you seek out your path. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing. We're all as much as we are so 
you know, connected and we're all human. We all have different ways that we need to live and eat. Like you and your husband probably eat differently. Mm -hmm. My husband can get up and he can do the whole bulletproof coffee thing, you know, just have coffee, put butter in it, blend it. And he's so happy until lunchtime. Me, I need to eat by 7 a.m. I need like a man sized breakfast. Mm. if I'm going to get through the morning. Like my breakfast matters so much. So men and women need to eat differently where you live. You know, I live in the Northeast where it's freaking cold. (laughs) You live in the South where it's warm and we'll eat differently. So, you know, be open to what's true for you and that Mm -hmm. that might change with the seasons or with the years. And, you know, going, going back to the whole vegan thing, let's give ourselves permission to evolve that, you know, the diet that healed me when I was 25, the vegan diet was not the diet that was going to sustain me. Mm -hmm. So what you do for a while, a cleanse, a detox, a whole 30 can be helpful for a little while to kind of, you know, kickstart something or help you heal something real quick. But maybe it's not the answer for you for the rest of your life. But that's uncomfortable for us. We want an answer and we want a path, right? right? We just want Give things to be the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And promise me that it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That is not true for anything in life. It's not true no. for parenting. It's not true for relationships. And it's not true for food. Everything changes. Ugh, I know. I know. Well, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> speaking of something everybody wants, what do you think women are missing when it comes to getting healthy and happy in their bodies? Oh, girl, play, <laughs> fun, play and fun. Every single woman should be integrating something that is just pure fun for her every day, especially if you're trying to change your relationship to your body and food. If you're trying to boost your metabolism or you know change how you feel in and about your body, mm-hmm. the quickest actually most successful way to do that is play. There's so much amazing science and research about play in the last 10 years and how it not just beneficial it is, but necessary. We need to have fun in our bodies. That's not food related. When we play, especially together, and I, I've got a whole thing around this I'll tell you about in a minute, but when we play, we release endorphins, Mm -hmm. which you know, lowers pain in the body, lowers inflammation, it boosts our energy, it releases oxytocin Mm -hmm. when we play with others, especially like when we're having fun together with somebody else, we release that oxytocin, which is that mm, like fun, yummy bonding neurotransmitters, all the good, happy chemicals in the brain fire when you're playing. Hmm. It also makes you more productive It makes you more relaxed, which actually puts you into the right metabolic state to lose weight. Because when you're stressed all the time, you can't digest properly and your metabolism is off. So play actually puts you into that state that you need to be in to reach your health goals. That's fascinating. (laughs) I knew play was important, but I didn't know. I mean, well, it makes sense now that like, you know, vast studies have been done on it and, and its benefits for health. I love that. I was just this morning, I was filling out this massive questionnaire for, you know, I have a a new book coming out next year and the the marketing team at the publisher wants me to answer all these questions and I'm answering all these questions and I get to the one, this is so embarrassing, but probably a lot of people can relate. And it said, list your hobbies. And I was like, (laughs) fuck you. (laughs) Cause I don't have any right now. And it's, I I had just had this conversation with my husband because my husband's a woodworker and he, our garage is like this workshop and he can make pretty much anything I ask him to, which is, it's lovely to have a a handy husband, but I find myself getting resentful, like on the weekends and I'm like bugging him and I'm like, can you help me with the laundry? And like, you know, be just being a shit sometimes. And, and I have owned it and I've, I've told him, I'm like, I'm sorry, but you know, and so it's just, I think that is part of, you know, play and fun. It's just like doing, I, I do, I have a lot of dance parties with my kids and, and things like that, but I definitely have a lot less fun and play times than I did 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same with my son. Like we dance to music almost every morning before Mm. school. I truly treasure those moments and I'm kind of an omnivert. I am introverted and extroverted at times Mm -hmm. and I need alone time and I need time with just my girlfriends. And I'm a little, I have what I call sacred selfishness in my life where I really make time to go be on my own or take a trip with a girl 
girlfriend. I go into the wilderness, you know, once or twice a year and just be out there. But I need to go roller skating at least a dozen times every summer. I have hot pink roller skates (laughs) that are so fabulous. I always wanted my own roller skates when I was a kid and I finally got some. And in New York City, where I live, you can go roller skating at all the public rinks. And it makes me so happy. Mm -hmm. And my child sometimes comes with me and sometimes not. Sometimes I go by myself. I love riding my bike around with my girlfriends when the weather is good. I have a hula hoop. I have a rebounder. I have coloring books. Like I have all the things that make me happy. I have a coloring book. We need those. Yeah. Well, when I come to New York City, we'll have to go roller skating because I skate. Yes, (laughs) please. I I used to play derby. So, um, (sighs) Oh, yeah, that is a whole nother hobby. <laughs> yes, yes. But see, here's the deal. Most of us women think that we don't deserve play until we reach some goal. We save it as a reward mm-hmm. for something. Mm-hmm. I say, do it now. Do something yeah. fun now. Do something pleasurable in your body. That can be as simple as You know, I left this morning. I took what I call my executive workout. I went to the gym and I sat in the steam room for 15 minutes Mm -hmm. and then I took a shower and I left. And that was, (laughs) I love it. (laughs) That was my workout and it was great. It just felt so nice to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, taking time off, I try to have at least one lunch with a girlfriend because otherwise I will, you know, I work from home as you do too. And I will just stay at home all the time. Mm -hmm. We have got to incorporate fun. It's not something that's like a nice thing. It's necessary because otherwise all you're doing is punishing yourself. All you're doing is pushing harder and harder. And without fun in your life, what's the point? Yeah. yeah. For what? Yeah. No, I hear you. And I'm, I actually am making an effort when my dad died. I have a friend who her dad passed away like a month before mine and we've been corresponding a lot. And she, through her grief, she said, I'm going to take up a brand new hobby that has nothing to do with my dad. Because I thought when she said that she was going to take up a new hobby, the first thing I thought of was like, I'm going to start playing tennis regularly again. Cause that's what I did with my dad growing up. And then she said, you know, something that has nothing to do with my dad. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> okay. Mm. And so she told me what hers was. And I've always really been interested in modern calligraphy and you know, I love words. Words are, I have my heart and I'm like, why not make them beautiful? So I've been researching and I have a Pinterest board where I'm going to get the tools. And my husband actually asked me about it. Cause I think he's thinking like, what can I get you for your birthday? <laughs> so I am going to do that. I am going to do that. I'm just kind of like gathering information because usually I'm a person who will just like go to Michael's and like buy all the things and then they're mm. all wrong and I've spent all this money and then I don't do well, anything. Oh, I have a great idea for you. What? I did this this weekend. I hosted a bad art party. I love that. And I invited over five or six women. We brought together all of our random crafting materials, put it on my big kitchen table, and we all sat around and just glued stuff together. Oh my gosh, what a great it, idea. It was so fun. We spent like three hours just talking and making all these random crafting art projects. And the whole point was not to come away with something that looked pretty or cute. I mean, it could be, but the point was just like, just be creative. Just mm-hmm. be like seven. Make something for no purpose. It was awesome. They love all that. loved it. We had the best time. Oh, that's such a great idea. I might steal that. That's a great do idea. It. <laughs> okay. So question for you, how do women, uh, how do you feel like women act as our own worst enemies and how can we change that? That's a theme that we talk about a lot over here. What do you think? Well, there's a couple things. Perfectionism is killing us. Mm -hmm. The whole good girl syndrome for everyone else and be the perfect mom and the perfect wife and the perfect friend and the perfect employee or employer. That's killing us. Let's just be good enough moms for a couple days. Let's just be, let's aim for a C plus Mm -hmm. in life Mm -hmm. for a little bit and see how that feels. But then there's also comparison. Comparison yes. is nasty one. I certainly struggle with that one yeah. myself. When we compare ourselves to our best friends or someone we admire online. I mean, I do this in like the health coaching world. I see other women and I'm like, oh, they're doing so much better than I am. And then I look at my life. And I'm like, I'm so happy. Come yeah. on. Mm-hmm. Like I have everything I want. I got a great dude. I got a great kid. I like my work. Why am I comparing myself to her, you know, airbrushed 
world on right. Facebook. I have mm-hmm. no idea what it's like One behind the scenes. Yeah. So there's those two. There's perfectionism. There's comparison. And then, oh, women, we have got to support each other better. You know, I really believe that if women are going to combat the, you know, constant rampant everywhere, sexism, you know, misogyny, the way that our culture truly is set up for women to be held to a double standard constantly, we have got to support each other better. Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. means... That means having loving but fierce conversations together. It means encouraging a culture of bragging. This is my big thing (laughs) where we need to talk with each other more about what's going well and about how awesome we are. Mm -hmm. And when we get together, don't just have it be a bitch session. Have it be a brag session first. Mm -hmm. Start with something you're really proud of, a celebration, a win, because otherwise we get stuck stuck when we aren't allowed to brag, when it doesn't feel safe to talk about how, you know, how proud we are of ourselves, then we go back into that perfectionism and comparison. Mm -hmm. But what if you got together with your girlfriends once a week or every time something good happened, you called your best friend or your sister or your favorite cousin and you said, you know what, this great thing happened and I really just want to share it with someone. Right. How often do you do that? Mm -hmm. I do it with my girlfriends. Oh, see, but you're awesome. But well, and that's something that I had to learn. And I think what's really important in what you mentioned that I want to underline is that it is about sharing that with the right person, because if you don't or if you you know share it with the wrong person, they might judge you. They might get uncomfortable with your vulnerability of doing that. Like, I, you know, there are several different outcomes that could happen that would that might make a woman never want to share those stories again. So it is absolutely about finding the right person to do that with. And if you're not sure if your two or three girlfriends would be cool with this, ask them. Mm-hmm. Say, you know what? I heard this idea on this podcast about, you know, creating more of a a culture of bragging where we try to celebrate each other's wins more often. Would you be into that with me? Like, mm-hmm. just ask. See yeah. if you can create something. I'm a part of, I have my own coach. I'm in a women's group, a mastermind. And I've created one here in New York City where I get together with the same group of six women once a month and we talk about our businesses, but we really encourage each other to brag and celebrate each other via text on a regular basis and share a win or a celebration. You can do it no matter where you are or who you're currently in relationship or friendship with now. Mm-hmm. You can create it and, and we need it. We need it to feel safe to succeed if we're actually going to reach our goals. If it doesn't doesn't feel safe to succeed, we don't have that support, then we're never going to reach those goals because it doesn't feel like we're going to have someone there cheering us on. Mm -hmm. I love that. I start all of my, when I teach an online class, I start all of my group calls with going around with the women in my class and they share a win or a celebration. And I ask them like, what's working in your life right now? What's going great? And I start sometimes because in the beginning they're like, I don't even know what to say. And so I'll share a story or a win. And these are small things. I mean, these are not like, I found a cure for cancer. You know, like, <laughs> it doesn't have to be these grandiose things. I mean, these are small celebrations. Like I share a story about, you know, about self-awareness. Like I almost was passive aggressive with my husband and I paused and wasn't. So it's a win. That's a huge win. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things I want the women to start thinking about. And then after a few weeks goes by, they're ready. Like at the beginning of the call, they're like, Oh, right. I have my win or I have more than one or they're sharing them in the Facebook yeah. group. And it's, it is just about sort of like shifting that mindset. And like you said, to be in a safe place where that is encouraged and celebrated with you. Yep. We need it. We need it. If we're going to change things we that do. has to start in those female friendships. Um, absolutely. So I have one more question for you. And it's a question I ask almost all of my guests. And that question is what surprises you about the work you do with women? Oh, how much I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, No, I'm constantly re-inspired by other women. I'm constantly re-inspired by the lives that they create, the challenges they overcome. I'm just, I love it so much. It's so interesting to me. It never gets old. 
I'm just, I say, I, th- I always say to this to my husband, like women are so freaking cool. Mm-hmm. Like they don't even know how amazing they are. I think that's why I love it so much. Cause I get to finally like shine that spotlight back on them. It's like, you are so incredible. Do you know how awesome you are? And then they finally start to feel it and then they take off mm-hmm. and it's just, it's beautiful. So it's kind of not altruistic. Like I love the work that I do because it feels so good. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. I love that. It's always a different answer. So I, I always love asking that question. And, and thank you so much for being here. Everyone, all the links are in the show notes. Head on over to grab those. AlexandraJameson.com. And you have your own podcast as well, right? I do. Her Rules Radio. And I hope to have you on my show soon. Yeah, Her Rules Radio. And I know that my people love podcasts. So if they're looking for a new one and you have cravings, cleanses, and can they find all of that over on your website? Yeah, they can go to cravingscleanse.com or actually, you know what we were talking about, the different root causes of cravings. I've got a cravings quiz that'll show them which of those four roots is theirs. So they can go to cravingsquiz.com. Cravingsquiz.com. That'll be in the show notes. So it'll be easy peasy for you to click on over to that. And as always, Ask Kickers, thank you so much for being with me every week. I appreciate you so much. And until next time, I will see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. Hey, ass kickers, you know what would help me out so much if you left a rating and review for this podcast. Your Kick-Ass Life podcast will always be free to you and to help me get more awesome guests and to spread the word, it helps tremendously if you leave a rating and a review. Now, they don't particularly make this super easy to do, so I'll help you out a little. If you're in iTunes and you're on your phone, when you are in the podcast app, you need to search for Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. I know, even if you're subscribed, this is how you do it. So when you search for it and you see it come up, click on the cover art, then towards the top where it says reviews, click that, scroll down a tiny little bit, and then click write a review. Stitcher is a bit easier if you're on Android. The easiest way I found to do this is to type into Google stitcher.com, your kick-ass life, and voila, my podcast should pop up as the first link. Scroll down and click write a review. That's it. Thank you so very much. You have no idea how much it helps me when you do that. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.